weapons in our hands with which the devil would just take it out of our hands, shake it in God's face and say, they're mine. Send them to hell with me because here's their sins. So if Jesus just cleaned house, we'd still have our sins. And so he dies. And in dying in our place, Satan loses the one weapon, unforgiven sin, with which he could damn us. So, like I've said before, and little children remember it, so I'll say it again, all Satan can do is gum us because his fangs have been removed. And he can kill you with his gums, but he cannot damn you with his gums. The poison is gone. Now, here's the question. Where did he come from? Why does God tolerate this murderous behavior still 2,000 years after the cross? In Genesis, it appears that all's well He creates everything good, and then you have evil. Something happened. What happened? If God didn't create evil, what happened? There are clues, and I think they're only clues, but they're pretty clear. Two verses, Jude 1, 6, 2 Peter 2, 4. I'll read them to you. Jude Verse 6, there's only one chapter in Jude. Jude says this. The angels who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. Angels who did not keep their position of authority, but left it. 2 Peter 2.4, God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment. So it appears that there were once a great host of holy angels, holy angels, and They did not stay in their own position of authority. They sinned. And that sin was a kind of insurrection. They didn't want to be subordinate. They wanted to be self-exalting. And they thought self-governing. And they were evicted from heaven into hell, and evidently they have some measure of liberty, though not absolute liberty now to hurt. And it leaves another question. Why? How did that happen? That's not an easy question to answer. In fact, The ultimate biblical answer, the ultimate final biblical answer, raises more questions. It doesn't end questions. Raises questions. Seems to me that the way you approach such things is to acknowledge you see in a mirror dimly. Now we know in part, then we will know fully, even as we are fully known. And we acknowledge that all of our questions probably will not be answered in this age. But we ask them anyway. And then we seek answers in the Bible. Why did they fall? Why did they sin? Now, some people find help in saying that the angels had free will and that God, therefore, could not 
exert enough influence to hold their allegiance or keep them adoring him? I do not find that a helpful answer for several reasons. It doesn't answer the question why a perfectly holy angel in the presence of an infinitely holy and beautiful and attractive God would suddenly use his free will to hate God. It's no answer. <laughs> to say they have free will is no answer. <laughs> it also runs into some great difficulties as to the way the Bible describes God's relationship to the devil and to the demons. So I'm not helped by that answer. And here's the way I go about trying to answer the question, if it can be answered. I begin to read the whole Bible asking this question. What does the Bible present to us through the whole range of redemptive history from beginning to end as the way God relates to Satan's will? I don't want to just speculate. I just want pictures. I want Bible verses. I want Bible statements about how God relates to Satan. And then maybe seeing enough ways that God relates to Satan, I could project back and say, well, if he relates to him that way here, he related to him that way there. That's my approach. And you can assess whether you think that's a wise approach. So what I want to do is just give you seven or eight glimpses of how God relates to to Satan in the Bible. Number one, Satan is called the ruler of this world in John 12, 31. However, other texts say things like this, Daniel 4, 17. The Most High is the ruler over the realm of mankind and bestows it on whom he wishes. Or Psalm 33, 10. The Lord nullifies the counsel of the nations. He frustrates the plans of the peoples. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart from generation to generation. From which I infer, yes, Satan is the God of this world and the ruler of this age, but not ultimately. He is a lackey with a leash underneath this great God who decides who kings are and when they're done. Number two, though unclean spirits are everywhere in the world doing deceptive and murderous things, Jesus Christ is described as having all authority in heaven and on earth, and then you get an amazing statement like this, clearly spoken as the truth about Jesus in Mark 1.27. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. You should think a long time about that. <laughs> when Jesus speaks with absolute authority, the devil does what he is told. Period. Right? That's what it says. There aren't seasons when Jesus is not authoritative and seasons when he is authoritative. If it says in the Bible, Jesus commands the unclean spirits and they obey, they obey whenever he speaks that way. That's number two. Number three, Satan is described as a roaring lion prowling and seeking to devour people. And Peter says in 1 Peter 5, 8, resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren in the whole world. In other words, the jaws of the lion are suffering. Resist, he's prowling around like a lion seeking to devour people. Resist him firm in your faith because you know that the same experience of suffering is being experienced by your brethren around the world. Therefore, the suffering of Christians in Afghanistan, 15 of them left, right? There's way more. 
They're just in the news. The suffering